right, well, it's great to be here. Um, so I'm gonna tell um, a slightly more specific story, slightly more grounded. My, my background is in computer science and machine learning. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a, a, a small story about some current research that I'm working on and then zoom out to talk about what I see machine learning being really helpful for um, in medicine in the short term, in medical research in the shorter term. So the, the small vignette that I'm going to tell you about is about disease subtyping. So one application area that I work in is with autism spectrum disorders. And here, um, there's, it's called a spectrum disorder. There's many different kinds of autism. Among clinicians, you'll hear the phrase, when you've met a child with autism, you've met a child with autism. And if we could understand the patterns in these disorders better, then we may have a clue to, well, are there different causes for them? And can we design better treatments? And so the, the way I approach this question is by looking at electronic health records, which are very, very low quality, poor quality data. But there's lots of them. And we have the advantage that you know, all sorts of populations, underserved populations, are more likely to make it into a clinic, um, whereas there might not be in a clinical trial. So that's our motivation here, that there's a lot of data. There's almost a moral imperative for us to go out and analyze it. Um, if we can discover things that could be helpful for patient health. So let me just lead you through um, this process just to, um, it, in most of this audience I believe is more on the medical side, um, to just uh, see how this pattern works um, in terms of machine learning and data analysis. So the first thing we did is we took this data, we pre-processed it, we counted the number of times any particular billing code came up um, and in, in every six month window for each patient and then that created an initial set of feature vectors. So the first part is always processing the data in some way. Um, and then we applied a clustering algorithm. We've done much more sophisticated things since then, but just to lead you all through the pipeline so we can talk about the process. And then once we got out the clusters, well, we had to spend um, several weeks of just trying to interpret them and figure out, well, okay, we grouped all these patients together, but why are they similar? You know, what, what was the algorithm thinking when it decided to do this? And that, I think, is going to be one of the critical steps um, that we need to work together on in terms of how can we make our machines more understandable to humans um, so that they can work together in a team. And what we did in this particular case is we found that, okay, these clusters, again, after lots of hand looking at all these patients, um, there seems to be a group that has elevated, is elevated in psychiatric disorders, another group that had uh, elevated um, various neurological disorders, um, elevated GI disorders, and others that didn't seem to have anything particular going on. And then came the next step, which I think was the more exciting step, or the reason why uh, you know, all this research was worthwhile, because of course, okay, now we've characterized this thing, sure. Um, but it started, it, being able to define these groupings created an opportunity that wasn't there before, um, where we are able to now say, well, based on these really crappy data that were free and available, we were able to form these different subgroups. Now can we use that for other analyses, such as imaging studies? Now that we have a hypothesis about what might be different groups of people, do these people's brains look different? Um, how can this inform genomics and other omics studies? Now that we have these groupings, is it possible that there's over a thousand genes that have been implicated in autism spectrum disorders? Can we look at some of these and say, actually, it's not a thousand genes, it's some of the subgroups have some genes and other subgroups have other genes, right? Um, and what the machine learning allowed us to do was to generate the hypothesis for future research. I think is a, a, it's a, a slightly different use than just using it to do statistics, right, or, or, uh, or play games. And then, of course, doing this analysis opened up a whole lot of methodological questions as well. That's the stuff that I study, and in particular, this question of how can we make these methods easier for people uh, to be able to interpret after the fact. And so one thing that we did afterwards is uh, one of the reasons why this took so much time is that it, for those of you who are familiar with billing codes um, within the ICD-9 CM system, there's about 8,000 commonly used codes. That's too long of a number. That's too much for people to hold in their minds. Um, so we developed methods to do automatic summarization. How can we uh, provide this data into a format that people are familiar with? So we use the format of ontologies to be able to summarize the data. So here again, we're trying to meet people halfway. The computers don't care. They can handle very, very large sets of feature vectors, but we can't. Um, and how, what's the right way to compress that information? Well, let's think about how clinicians are trained and clinical researchers are trained. 
if they're trained to think with certain concepts, then maybe it's a good idea to summarize the data using those concepts. So if we're used to thinking of all those bottom codes as forms of epilepsy, because we've decided that, then maybe it's a good idea for the computer to know that too. So instead of giving you, you know, 25 different features that all have to do with epilepsy, maybe it can give you just one. Maybe it can tell you, actually, epilepsy seems to be highly, or highly prevalent in this particular subgroup of patients with autism spectrum disorder. Um, and, and these methods allowed us to produce, you know, 10 times sparser representations um, and basically replicated our previous analysis in hours rather than kind of the weeks of kind of grungy handwork that we had done before. So zooming out a bit, um, I, I really see this area of phenotyping as a really important area where machine learning can be valuable for, uh, for medical research. And there's a ton of success stories, both in the unsupervised setting, where you say, actually, I, I have no idea. You know, what are the subtypes in this particular disease? You take a batch of data, it produces uh, clusters or some other form of low-dimensional representation, and you use that for your next study, right? Um, that you don't need to know why those things exist, but it's very hard to come up with hypotheses when the data uh, get very complex, and here's a way of doing that. Um, there's also been a great success in, in supervised phenotyping, where you say, well, I've got this large cohort, um, and actually, I just need, can, I, can you find me the patients that have something like inflammatory bowel disease? Because I want to see whether there's a difference between some part of their omics and the patients who don't. And again, uh, to be able to extract that very simple thing, does this patient have X, from a health record is very noisy. It's actually very hard. And here's, again, a place where machine learning algorithms are very good at processing all the data that's available in the record to be able to build this sort of classifier. And once you have that, then now you can apply your study to much, much larger data sets that you didn't have access to before, because now these are on clinical practice scale, not on research study scale. So most of this um, discussion, I believe, is going to be focused more on the research side, but I just wanted to also point out that you know, these, these tools are going towards practice. Um, there's been very recent work um, in detecting um, early onset of sepsis in the ICU. Um, there's work on, uh, there's a long history of work on computer-aided detection and imaging. And on the behavior side, so you know, medicine is, is mostly about when people are sick, but we are also focusing on wellness. Um, how much can we find out about people's behaviors by patterns of usage on their phones in unintrusive ways? Again, the, we have very good methods for a lot of these things right now. So it all seems kind of magical, right? Um, so let's, uh, what I want to do is just take a second to talk about what's the common thread here, right? Like what, what made all of these uh, you know, successes possible? Um, as, as alluded to before, these are all situations where the data was too complex for humans to independently analyze. So if you, if you look back here, ICUs generate boatloads of data. Um, imaging, also tons and tons of data. Um, same with phones. Um, same with electronic health records, have many different kinds of fields in them. And so uh, I, I've had uh, discussions with folks who do other sorts of, um, you know, can we, can we create decision-making tools to help you know, community health workers in rural and uh, underserved settings and those sort of things? And that's not necessarily where I see a lot of machine learning being helpful, because in those cases, many times, you know, we're, we're good thinkers, right? We don't need help when, there's, when the data is relatively small and the options are relatively small, right? Where we really need help is where there's too much data for us to think about, and perhaps also stories that are too complex for us to think about. And as we are able to store more and more data, again, we're moving more and more into this regime where it's not just ICUs that have boatloads of data. In general, people are just generating loads of data, for example, on their phones. And I would argue that you know, this creates, again, a moral imperative for us to try to an analyze that data because hopefully that gives us clues into how to improve patient health. So where do I see the areas of greatest potential here? Um, so it, in the area of decision support, Again, thinking about where are those data-rich environments, uh, whether it's omics data, behavioral data, um, knowledge bases, et cetera, um, and also in hypothesis generation, um, and thinking about um, what sort of phenotypes are present in the data. And if, you, again, the data is too complex, maybe you need a machine to be able to scan over all of it and find some sets of patterns 
Actually, one of the things that we work on in our group is saying, are there multiple competing hypotheses or explanations for this particular data set? If you could cluster it this way and cluster it some other way, then maybe that in itself is really interesting, and then a human can pour over it and try to understand which one of these is it. Um, and so the, the human is still a very active player in terms of deciding what hypotheses are worth thinking about and finding a story for the hypothesis, because we're just doing kind of statistics here. But the, the machines are helping us synthesize a lot of data together that we wouldn't have been able to otherwise. So the last thing I want to, to mention is like, OK, so that's, that's hopefully cool, right? I, I imagine most people here are sold on data analysis. Um, uh, but how do we go forward together? Um, and this is really me uh, speaking as a computer scientist who is relatively new to the health space. I've been working in the health space for about four years or so, but all of my previous training is in math or statistics and uh, computer science. And one thing that I see um, is often incredibly hard is how do we design meaningful tasks, tasks that will be beneficial to clinical research or clinical practice um, that are still formal enough for computer scientists to really get into. RoboCop, you know when you won, right? How do you know when you won for these clinical problems? And I think that that's a, a really important thing. Um, where, and, and we play silly games, right? We try to predict diagnostic codes for like patients and like ICUs and stuff. This is easy. Doctors do this all the time, right? We don't need a machine to tell us, you know, what the, what what codes to put down, right? But we, the reason we play that game is because we know when we won, right? So I think one, one task uh, or question I have for all of you is coming up with uh, meaningful tasks that, you know, again, we, we know when we're winning. Um, and making that data easily available so that everyone can try to play that game. Uh, the, the next uh, thing that I want to talk about is algorithms, right? So that's mo mostly what I do. I, I work on designing algorithms. And uh, again, this is, all comes down to measurements and, and metrics. But one thing that seems to be very important is these notions of interpretability and interactivity, right? Where uh, we don't want the agent just working on its own. We, we want our agent to be working with a researcher to be able to help generate hypotheses. It has to be able to explain them somehow. It has to meet the human halfway, right? And what are the appropriate notions of halfway? And that's something where, um, to the extent that we can formalize them, I think we'll see um, a, a much bigger boom. There's, a, there's tons of excitement in these, da these days in the machine learning world about interpretability, just no one knows what it means. Right? So if we can define it, what it means in a particular context, I think, again, we can make great strides. And then finally, um, when it comes to evaluation, a lot of these techniques that I mentioned are very useful for hypothesis generation. And the, way, the reason I say so is that a lot of times the data are of poor quality. Right? What machine learning allows us to do is you know, try to glue together you know, partial sources, messy sources, places where things are missing. We know that there's biases, but we're like, but there's all this data. We should not just let it sit there. Right? We should analyze it somehow. Um, and that's why often it's better for hypothesis generation that rather than actually testing something right, or, or making those predictions. Um, you still need the clinician in the loop or the scientist in the loop to be able to make that final prediction. But what does that mean in terms of like, how we do science? Because right? now we're using really heavy powered machinery to generate the question. And then we will probably play our p-value games afterwards. Right? Um, and so there, there's this question of like, what, are the, what are the notions of um, evaluation that are, that are appropriate in this space? I think all of these questions, to the extent that we can formalize them together, uh, you know, right now, where, where are the computer scientists going? Well, they're, they're playing video games. Um, they're, they're doing ad placements for, uh, for Google and Yahoo. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity to do a lot of good in this particular space with health and medicine um, if we can find better ways to come together and formalize what tasks we're actually trying to solve. Thank you. <laughs>